Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast, where we dive deep into the media industry headlines and dissect the digital disruption that diverges the masses into the new media counterculture and away from the media establishment. Here is the king of podcasts. Here we go, episode 221 of the Broadcasters Podcast. This is KOP with you. And if you haven't checked out the last few episodes, I kind of go on themes in some cases with certain episodes, unless there's something important to talk about. Last week, we talked about Will Smith's best and worst night ever, the slap on Chris Rock. We talked about that last week. Week before that, I talked about, for the last two weeks before that, in the middle of March, we talked about the music industry and the mayhem with the digital revolution. That was really great stuff. And the fight for the new media spotlight, new music spotlight. And I hope you'll go and check out those episodes. Plus, we talked about Batman. We talked about the DC Universe. And we really went into that to start off the month. And it was great. And I hope all of you had a chance to listen to all that. Great episodes. Go ahead and look, listen back to past episodes. There's always certain things you want to catch up that are timeless and important and to catch up on a regular basis here on the program. So please make sure to go and check out broadcasterspodcast.com, broadcasterspodcast.com. Everything I'm doing is there. And I hope you'll go ahead and consider all that. So there we go. Thanks for listening in. Wherever you find the podcast, of course, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, whatever, well, Stitcher, Spreaker, you know, all of those. It's great stuff. Thanks for listening in. Tonight, we're going to talk about podcasting. There's a whole lot to talk about podcasting right now, and I want to get into that for all of you here. First of all, it's all these these major podcast players in the space. Positioning and pioneering. Listen, all these major corporations have found their way into audio. Streaming is starting to reach its peak when it comes to the amount of content available, to the amount of viewers, to the amount of subscriptions that are out there because everybody's starting to reach their peak. We knew this digital disruption since the pandemic started up was going to affect streaming so much, but there's still room for growth in podcasting, lots. And it hasn't reached the peak mode yet, especially when it comes to advertising. So we're going to talk about that for all you podcasters out there. Yours truly king of podcasts. I keep up on this thing right here. And you know what, too? I've got to say this. I actually was talking to somebody earlier about the fact that when I do the, I was actually talking to the host of Webcology, which is a show I produce for on WMR.FM. And I was talking to Jim Hedger, and I was telling to him, you know, when it comes to podcasting, there are just certain things that don't get talked about and don't get discussed. And, you know, the podcasting companies out there and the podcasters themselves that are trying to go ahead and get people to go and say, hey, here's the best equipment. Here's the way to do it. You know, and I remember talking to Jim and knowing that I've recorded with him for 15 years now. More than that, actually. It's coming up on 16 years uh, come October. And I'm saying to myself, you know, he still has his own little quirks when it comes to recording the show, but, like, the content is so good, and they've learned so much, and he feels like in the last five years, he's actually felt like we've actually gone somewhere. So shout out to Jim Hedger. And Digital Always Media, by the way, if you want to go and look him up. Now, the thing with this is that I told him the fact, you know, of the simple things I always worked on for my own podcasts. And the fact of the matter is that I have so much I can talk about when it comes to podcasting that I don't get a chance to do. But seriously, when I think about it, I am the one of the few people that I know so much about this business. And I am so good at what I do. But yet I don't ever have the likes of podcast movement or podfest. I mean, I did talk to Chris, Kiss, uh, Chris, 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 Chris Misos. Chris Mito, oh my Jesus, I cannot say it right now. Chris Mitos, right? He's the head of the Podfest Expo. Listen, I got to talk to him. Great guy. Offer me a Pecha Kucha. But the thing is, it's one of those things where I'm not going to get a chance to go ahead and speak as the expert I am at any of these shows. And I've pitched. No. You know, obviously, they have the other companies that are out there. You know, you want to get somebody from Microsoft, you want to get somebody from Shure or, you know, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, you want to get Bob Pittman out there and talk? Yeah, go right ahead. Pod Radio is podcasting's birthright. I'll never forget that. And it's fine. It's just funny that, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I got the website. I have the link. I have the social media handles. I claim King of Podcasts. It's mine. I haven't trademarked it yet, but I should. But it costs a little bit. Now, either which way, 
you know, if it wasn't making a whole lot more money, that'd be a different story. But like I said, I'm not some big cash machine marketing myself and putting out affiliate marketing sites with one page that shows like, here's the system, here's the program, here's the videos, here's the thing you need to do. No, I give out free, I give out free content. Hell, I remember doing a 30 part series that's available on Instagram and TikTok on my channels where you can look at podcasting 101. And I give you 30 different tips on podcasting that are very important. But when it comes to that, I mean, it's really the whole idea that the podcasting space, these radio people, and these people from uh, other media sources, oh, we know what we're doing. We know how to do this. Maybe you don't. You know, you're coming in to the space. You're trying to build something of yourselves. Sure. I, you know, I can appreciate you trying to do that. But the truth is, is that some of you are failing. Some of you companies, you're trying so hard and... It's the ones that are not trying so hard where they're just, you know, they're providing the programming and they're just bringing the right programs on and they're not trying to bring their own and create something that's going to be something else, right? Spotify is a great example of one of those that they, they pick up the right shows already created and they have other shows that are being created by other companies that they acquired and they brought on board and they do great stuff. Plus they have the complement of all the other podcasts That are going to be on that platform because Spotify is just great. Again, I can't speak enough about it. I curate playlists. I listen to Spotify every damn day for podcasts and for my own music. And for the music, I curate regularly on three playlists all the time. But it's funny how the digital disruption has come in with podcasting and how all these markets are trying to find the best way to get the audience to them to pull in all these listeners. And why do they want all these listeners? For content, and but, but the content that they can sell. They want to be able to get more profit out of it. It's, it's a pretty clear system. But this traditional idea of what they're doing, they're trying to figure out the best way to do it. Listen, I'm taking advantage of it too. Because with my hosting platform, I get to throw ads on here at the start of the show, in the middle, and at the end. I'm going to make some money off of this too. It's not going to be much. But you know what? Whatever I make on this show, I put back into the show. All right. So one year worth of one year's worth of ad revenue, which was in 2020, when I had all that money coming in for doing all this content at home and pandemic and being stuck in place. Well, I went ahead and invested in a new Shure microphone, the Shure SM7 USB. And I use this thing like crazy. I'm I mean, I'm on this thing talking into it probably about six days a week. Or probably seven, as a matter of fact. I use it a lot. You know, one of the things I also learned, too, is uh, I use it for Chrome. When I want to go and type messages, or I want to type emails or whatever, I want to just talk into it. I just use the extension for voice of text that Chrome has, and it's fantastic. And it's very, very uh, accurate. So I can use that, talk right into my microphone, into that, get the messages out. So if I want to go ahead and, you know, transcribe, I could do it, I guess. I don't know if it's that solid. It'll just stay like that, but it's a kind of a nice idea. That's the one thing they got to figure out is the best way to get transcription to be so accurate because the, you know, the, the conversion is not perfect. You still have to go and do things. There's the script. There's others that are out there and they're great, but you know what? I remember there was a time where you had to go to like to the Philippines or India to outsource that kind of thing. That's a lot of work too, but all I know is that podcasting, there's a lot of ways to go and monetize, a lot of ways to repurpose the content, which many people have learned how to do it with video. And that's great. Listen, I watch a lot of podcasts on video. And they got their studios. They all learned from Howard Stern. So did I. And we learned our green screens. Like, I still remember when I had people that were doing video content. What was it? 2010. And I remember people getting on the Camtasia and trying to work all that stuff out. Let's get on here. Let's get the uh, let's get the streaming up. And it wasn't HD yet. It was still fuzzy, but we were, we were getting there. We were getting there. I still remember when podcasts first started. Like really, the first podcast I really listened to was in wrestling. WCW Live, Bob Ryder and Jeremy Borash wrestling in two thousand one. They were doing podcasts, basically what podcast it is, but it was a live radio show. But they were taking feedback from the audience. They were taking phone calls. Essentially, what a podcast is now, because it was on the internet. Now, you didn't archive them as of yet. I don't think they were able to archive yet, and that, I don't think they did that yet. 
But by the time I got to working in podcasting in 2005, they started it. We knew how to record content, but it was a matter of being able to put it up so that people could go ahead and listen to it, stream it, or download it. And then the iPhone changed everything. The iPad also changed everything. But I'm just going back into history. But when it comes to what the corporations are doing right now to try to work off of this system, the new Radio 2.0. I mean, I know everybody wants to give a new name to podcasting, but really it's Radio 2.0. HD radio. Radio through smart speakers. That's still Radio 1.0. Podcasting is Radio 2.0. It's a new form. It's on demand which was not something that you had with regular radio before. So this is where we are, Radio 2.0. And I feel like I want to talk it like that more, and I want to refer to it more as Radio 2.0, because that is what podcasting is. And so the companies that are radio-based, they want to get into this, and they've tried their best, and they've struggled. I'll say this. So I'm working with somebody right now that works for a major radio company, or has had a lot of access to major radio companies, and they're in the podcasting business. And their thing is, when they talk to me, they're always concerned about numbers. Because when they want to reach out to agencies, because they're talking with us so they can go ahead and work on bringing agency ads onto some of our networks. But these agencies, working with podcasters, of which radio has always had a particular set of information and numbers. Nielsen, before that, Arbitron. or Or it could be Eastland. Or it could be whatever. We'd have ratings. And those ratings were based on samples. And those samples would give a certain amount of information to the audience based on demographic, based on cum, based on time spent listening, all that. Which is fine. And those numbers were acceptable to regular ad agencies, your traditional agencies. But the online ones where they want to go and push everything by cost per click, cost per measurement, CPM. They want to know how much of an audience you have. Tell me impressions. Tell me downloads. Tell me streams. Tell me subscribers. And you know what? That's a hard thing to say. And you know what I got told? You know, that they want to trust the platforms. And the fact that all these platforms that host all podcasts, that the APIs are accurate. No, they're not. Do you realize, if you ever look at your podcast, and you look at how many different places your show is available, there's a reason why you put the name of your podcast in a Google search term. Trust me, you're going to get more than 100 search terms. You know why? Because there's a, that many out there of RSS aggregators and feeds that are picking up your RSS feed from somewhere else, from the original site or from Apple, Amazon, whatever. Like They're, they're getting from there. And you can't count those numbers. And you can also not deduct and deduce how many people are listening to a particular podcast at any given time. You can't determine that either. And only certain sites will give you certain information like what's funny is uh, for what spotify has on their platform you can look at demographics you can look at the audience in terms of gender and age group which is great and i like that but it's only so much we're going to get and it's only a sample size because if you're talking about trying to get the stats for everybody out there of what you're doing pretty impossible task if you ask me but they're worried about that and they're trying so hard so, I mean, I understand what they're coming from. I see what they're trying to do. But they want to ask for all these numbers because they want to quantify how much they want to charge for advertising to all these podcast platforms. And, of course, they want to sell it in bulk. They want to make it easy. And they don't want to do dollar a holler. They don't want to do, like, oh, pay per ad. No, no, no. They want to say, okay, we're going to buy this amount of ads, and it needs to reach this amount of cost per measurement. And that's it. And they're going to take this advantage of put all these advertisers out there for next to nothing, unless you get them for live reads, of only which a certain percentage of podcasters get to do. So these companies are trying so hard to get themselves out there to profit. And these ad agencies that are antiquated in their ways of working, they're worried about how they need to get themselves out there so they can get the kind of money that they want. And they don't get how they're going to do it. They don't have a, they, they got a plan in place and these people have done radio for years and they're programmatic and they're, all their platforms are working a certain way, but you know, when you have to work towards the third party and get them on board to go and insert, listen, the system, the technology has always been ahead. So to insert ads now, you know, dynamically inserted ads it's easy it's smooth the transitions are perfect now 
Like it, just in the last five years, they've gotten so good at doing this. Like when you see an ad, when you hear an ad right now, you don't hear the ad sounding really like shit. Like I mean, I'll tell you anything that iHeartRadio has right now when they're when they're programming platform, their programmatics on Spreaker or what the, what Red Circle's using for theirs, it's magical. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's really solid. It's crystal clear. It's done. It's seamless. And it just drops right in. You're not like you used to be when you listen to a podcast, you'd have to wait a little bit for that ad to go ahead and play through. And sometimes it would just buffer and you would struggle. Do you remember how YouTube used to be like that too? You'd have particular ads on and there would be a certain, there would never be like a, a same similar, you know, quality or similar format. But man, sometimes you'd have ads that would just stutter so bad and then you would just wait to get to your content. Now it is seamless. They have perfected that. So the ad placement is the easy part. The advertisers and bringing those advertisers onto your feed. That's the difficult part is bringing them in. And that's because they're going to work with these big corporate giants working their way doing things. For us, where I work, we're still doing the old-fashioned way. We do it like radio. We reach out to advertisers. We show the value of what we are. And they come on board and they stay for years. And I can tell you, I've had groups that I had companies that have been with me for over a decade. Happy. It's when they couldn't afford when, when something happened, recession, whatever it is, when they couldn't afford to keep doing it. That's when they stopped. Otherwise, they kept going and we were doing great. And, you know, the investment they would make in their marketing Compared to what we do, like, you know, getting a, a booth or exhibiting at a show. I mean, it's this big market, this digital marketplace, this place of all these consumers that are listening to all these shows with long retention, with a lot of time to listen in. They're giving a, a, an hour to four hours to six hours a week intently listening. Okay, and this is passive programming. They don't have to necessarily be sitting in front of the TV watching. They could be doing anything. They could be flying. They could be in the car, driving. They could be walking. They could be exercising. They could be doing anything. And maybe they're not listening to music. They're listening to a podcast. And that happens. You could be at work and you're listening to a podcast. You listen to your, to your desktop, your smart speaker. I have, what, five, six different ways to go and listen to it. I got different speakers, different platforms where I can listen to many different ways to listen to podcasts. If one listen to my show, I got a million different ways to do it. And to advertise is the part we're trying to work on the most. We're trying to get there, see what can happen. It's not easy. But that's the part that I think about the most when it comes to podcasting and saying to myself, what are we going to do to get ourselves to a certain level? We're working on it really hard. And that's what it comes down to. It's really, it's great. Like, I mean, I love podcasting. I love that the fact that we still have grassroots podcasting out there and these big corporate giants that could do their shows. So you got their lane. We got ours. NPR still does great work, period. Like I always say, NPR doesn't have to go and be on the on the air anymore. Why do they need terrestrial? Just give up the towers and give up the uh, airspace. Just stick to podcasting. You guys got the programming so well and so unlocked, and you are so well engaged into that. You're making a lot of money there. Why be government supported the other way? Let the government support go through the National Public Radio because you don't need the radio on the terrestrial side. And when you need television, you already have NPR. You already have PBS. You don't need NPR. On, on on air? No. On demand? Yes. It's the way it should be. So now that I've gone through my diatribe, I'm going to get into the stories that are all encompassing podcasting this week. And there's a lot that's going to bring up. So first of all, The Verge brought up a story, and I wanted to bring this up, and I held on to this from a couple of weeks ago. How SiriusXM bought and bungled a beloved podcast network. They left in the podcast with a $325 million deal, and it's off to a messy start. Ashley Carmen of TheVerge.com writes that they bought Earwolf, and the same people that have Earwolf, which is a comedy podcast network, has a roster of talented comics, the Sklar Brothers, the Harris Whittles, Brett Gilman, Jimmy Pardo, 
Then you have Paul Shear, who hosts How Did This Get Made, which was recorded in a band re- rehearsal space in the middle of Hollywood. No talk of ads, very low lo fi. The idea of selling ads wasn't even a thing. There was nobody making deals in podcasting when that show was created. Now, there were early ads on SiriusXM for LegalZoom and Stamps.com, and the team also solicited fan donations and sold merch. And Earwolf had a show like Comedy Bang Bang, its flagship show that did bring in advertisers to support the small and medium-sized podcast that made up the network. The network was created by Jeff Orridge and Comedy Bang Bang founder Scott Ackerman, Earwolf. And it combined with the mid-roll in 2014 to form mid-roll media and EW Scripts, which is a, they own Food Network and HGTV and all that kind of stuff. Then Scripps bought Stitcher in 2016. Then you combine the assets. This is deregulation, basically, just like in radio back in 1996. Same thing. Sirius XM bought all these brands 2020 uh, for $325 million. So Sirius XM basically being iHeartRadio or Clear Channel, where they just bought up stations. They bought up this content. That was it. The move encapsulates the current podcasting movement. Big tech companies spending huge sums in search of audio success. They do. They all do so out of necessity. Innovate or die. And Ashley, you are absolutely correct. What a great. Let me read that again. That. Wow. What. What an incredibly well written point right here. I'm going to read that again. The move encapsulates the current podcasting movement. Big tech companies spending huge sums in search of audio success. They all do so out of necessity, innovate, or die. Wow. Now, they talk about these other companies with Spotify where, you know, they can't run a platform fully dependent on record labels and royalties. They need podcasts to diversify its revenue. Sirius XM is a satellite radio subscription business. They can't bank on its customers, particularly the younger generation, wanting to listen to anything other than their phone apps in the car. So they invested $75 million in SoundCloud and bought Pandora for $3.5 billion in 2018 in a move to capture listeners' attention, the digital listener. So in both cases, small podcast networks offered advantages they didn't have, expertise in in-demand, on-demand audio and storytelling, a devout fan base, and an arsenal of quality programming. So for smaller networks, Earwolf and Parent Stitcher being acquired by a giant had perks. It gave them the access to deeper pockets that could make them more competitive when trying to retain hit shows to recruit new stars. But there were 13 former employees across Stitcher picking to diverge in anonymity because of NDAs and fear of retaliation, they said the mer- merger was sparked by confusion, culture clashes, shifting of objectives. And about 145 people worked at Stitcher when it was bought. And since then, a quarter of them have left. Many shows have also left the network, too, including Hollywood Handbook, an early and prominent show that's now on Patreon Independent. And also a show called Homophilia, which is now on World of Wonder. Now, while Earwolf was initially a beacon for comedy talent with minimal, minimal pressure around numbers or performance, the broader audio industry has been shifting towards a scale where bigger and bigger hits are critical to staying afloat, which is what corporate does. And with the X factors of a pandemic, a new corporate environment, and growing ways for shows to make it on their own without network support, the moment was right for talent reckoning. Quote, you either have to be very small or very big. Yes, very hard to exist in the middle, and we're choosing to go big. There you go. And so Stitcher had a lot of problems after the fact. And you know what? Stitcher was so great when they before they came on the Sirius XM. It was really that was one of the platforms I thought was very important for my content. I got a lot of audience off of there. Now it's gone so back. So Stitcher's ad sales model disadvantaged smaller shows and failed to land them consistent revenue. And it presented a problem because hosts receive the minimum guarantee and then make money off of ad share agreement. The sales team later points out that only employed white team members, which employed employees that that were led to say the incidents in which hosts of color felt especially underserved. They move along and talk about that part. And then we move along and say, okay, a person familiar with Stitcher's finances told this writer that direct response advertisers, traditional broadcast bands, brands that offer promo codes, stop spending money during the pandemic, effectively cratering smaller shows revenue and fueling the host uprising. 
quote, there wasn't something we could do that would just suddenly make the shows make more money, and some of the things they suggested while well-intentioned were just impossible. And the company still responded by committing additional revenue guarantees for some affected shows and dedicating six figures in marketing dollars to smaller shows. It also hired a woman of color to prominent role on the sales team, though she left less than a year later. Don't forget, remember, we talked about iHeart Radio and having to deal with unionization and dealing with that part. So SiriusXM finalized this deal to acquire Stitcher. So if Stitcher was already coming out bad after this came through. So one of the things that was asked about was, would podcasting a SiriusXM be an ad sales business or a subscription one? Would the subscription matter most? And should a new business be built around podcasting? What type of talent would be best to sell ads against anyway? Well, the approach was, well, yeah, let's just do all that. Stitcher employees first heard about the acquisition through the press, and that created bad vibes and mistrust. And Stitcher management, they say didn't comment on the rumors and delayed all hands meetings to discuss it. And then one host confirming the sale without much detail. When, when the company joined SiriusXM, employees had to adjust to a wholly new company, wholly new company in a pandemic. Everything happened virtually. Then SiriusXM seemingly bought Stitcher for its ad business or its, ex, to expand its preeminent position in digital audio advertising. It also gained subscription revenue from Stitcher Premium, their bonus content offering, which already had 130 to 140,000 subscribers at the time of sale. Expectations about the purchase ranged among the employees I, that he spoke to, this writer did, and some received raises, others didn't, and broadly employees say they felt disempowered and un, uninspired when having, having to run decisions through SiriusXM's bureaucratic ladder, corporate, corporate, corporate. When this comes in and you're used to this grassroots type of programming, yeah, this all sucks. This is horrible to get into. And then they say, one employee talked about, quote, it shifted from a excitement and hey with your skill and your special sauce we can make this thing really great to oh you guys are so small you really don't understand how any of this works so just quiet down and follow our lead another says quote i was shocked by how uncurious people were there about how we had succeeded in podcasting or how we did what we did because there is this whole you know thought process that a bob Pittman would go and come on and say hey podcasting's radio's birth rate like they think that, you know, because they were doing radio first, that they should easily transition to podcasting. Well, they learned the hard way. They were wrong. The knowledge gap made Stitcher employees, experts in the podcast industry, feel like they walked into a company they didn't want or need or help. Need their help despite evidence of the contrary. Various employees say they had to educate the SiriusXM team on what made a good podcast. The SiriusXM team mainly suggested adopting various SiriusXM shows, and one employee says they had to explain that an RSS feed being live didn't mean that they were playing in it, in it right now, like they don't understand the difference between radio and podcasts. Yeah, that disconnect's real. It still is. Trust me. Former sales team member says Stitcher never allowed advertisers to pre-approve the actual audio of a host, read only the ad copy they receive, but SiriusXM at times made pre-approval, pre-approval part of the process, which they say turned into a communication nightmare. Another person said cross-promoting shows with other networks, which is a standard broadcast marketing move, became difficult because SiriusXM implemented a minimum ad spend, straining relationships with podcasting partners who were used to paying $100 for an ad spot, not thousands. And the marketing for Stitcher was also used to buying ads on Spotify for promotion, but was told to, quote, never spend another dime on Spotify again once they joined SiriusXM. When you have companies like this with that traditional radio mind, because all they're doing is running on satellite, but they're still, they're still radio. No, they have this whole model. Oh, we can get all these celebrities to come on and do shows with us, and that's going to make enough for the subscriptions. Hey, we're going to run off of Howard Stern's fumes until it goes away. When one point, about 10 million people actually went on the Sirius and bought Sirius XM for Howard Stern. Now, about a, about a million, maybe two. That's it. The culture fit wasn't right either. These former employees said multiple people point out to a survey of the HR team at Sirius XM asked them to complete about how things were going on a town hall with hell's a response. Employees raised concerns about diversity within the company, but were told in response they couldn't have diversity issues because the company employed a female CEO. Wow, that is nasty. They also routinely hated on this competition rather than reflecting on why those products were working. Spotify is the devil of SiriusXM, one employee said. 
And then the other offered a rallying point for the team in which a former employee called a boomer business mentality like a toxic business mindset. And then another employee says, I've been called on numerous meetings for saying Spotify. I was, I was like, oh, yeah, I was listening on Spotify. And a legacy Pandorian will, will unmute and be like, what is that? At the same time, executives didn't seem to have a full picture of his podcast competitors. During one all-hands meeting, for example, DJ Khaled joined as a special guest because he apparently loves Pandora. But he hosts a podcast on Amazon Music. The moment emphasized to at least one person on the Stitcher podcast team that the company didn't know the space well. Content strategy remained a point of confusion. Sirius XM decided to go after fiction podcasts because, you know, we have serial and all that type of stuff, right? You know, uh, what's the show that Bravo had that was based on it? John, um, I can't remember now. Dirty John, that's the name of it. Thank you. Okay. At one point, Sirius XM decided to go after fiction podcasts, like I said, only to tell his team around three months to stop pursuing the strategy. Then they invested in Auto Up, Audio Up. It was a company designed to make scripted shows, making its internal team look like they didn't know what they were talking about, the external partners. And a spokesperson said that work on original fiction podcasts continues inside the company. And so one person would say that when we came to SiriusXM, we were promised that SiriusXM would let us do what we want. And in fact, our deals were far, by far worse now than we were before. By worse, I mean laughable amounts of money. Senior Vice President of Communications Patrick Raleigh characterized the findings of the Verge's reporting as being typical of the challenges facing any corporate acquisition with staff and former executive turnover, transitions to the company's preferred systems and technologies, and many to address employees' concerns. Sirius XM and Stitcher leadership worked together to make sure the transition went as smoothly as possible. Many of the concerns addressed in the story presented predated the acquisition and were quickly handled once the company joined Sirius XM. Yeah. But throw it under the rug. That's it. There's a lot where well, this thing is a long story, but like I said, that's the whole idea of what's happening. Sirius XM is not the only one having issues. Spotify as well. Business Insider reported on shows from Gimlet Media, which Spotify purchased in 2019. Remember Mogul, which is a great series. It was lagging behind Spotify's other networks. And also they had a public confrontation with Rachel Disparage in its studio. In January, Spotify shut down its homegrown production studio, which they said at the time had never been given a clear direction. But their acquisitions also arrived at the time of upheaval for the broadcasting industry. Creators, those with small little loyal fan bases, now have more options. They can go to Patreon or Earwolf founder Ackerman's launch sub subscription offerings through new partners. Because right now, Ackerman worked with Acast to launch Comedy Bang Bang World in October last year with ad-free and bonus content. Most employees and hosts at Stitcher seem to understand the podcast industry has shifted and Earwolf's early energy couldn't last. Quitting the job today means logging off Zoom forever. Not taking one last stroll past the wall of van speakers, spoken word audio is now a fundamental part of multiple deep-pocketed companies that need podcasts to survive. Free laughs won't pay the bills. Corporate personified. But you see what they're trying to do. Corporate doesn't really have the intent of really going underneath and really finding out what to do to move the needle and to put content that really is in touch with the audience. They're going to use their deep pockets to find companies that will get the technology they need and to find the content they need. They're just going to buy them out. But what they don't realize, they're not going to give that company, they just bought autonomy. They're going to say, no, no, we're going to make you do this because there's a miscommunication. That lack of communication, that micromanagement that comes up when you don't have somebody that's on top of this, a good CEO that is on top of what's happening here and making sure that all this stuff is taken care of, well, they need to watch out for that, and they're not. One place that has not been talked about that does a really good job with podcasts is YouTube. And you know what? A story that came out from TubeFilter.com. They said that YouTube has plans for podcasting. A new pitch deck has come out, and they got it. Here was what we got. They're offering some enticing incentives in front of potential podcasting partners, but haven't offered official statements on the specifics on its approach to audio. So it was an internal pitch deck that was shared with podcasting newsletter Pod News, 
which she includes to several audio-centric features YouTube is working on. Uh, YouTube appears to be planning on providing a dedicated landing page for podcasts, audio ads, and new metrics for publishers. And this is an 84-page slide deck in its presentations to podcast publishers. Three particular slides caught the newsletter's attention. They compromise, they comprise, excuse me, a looking ahead in which YouTube discusses future plans for its podcasting vertical. And the company approach to the audio world is being led by one of their longtime employees, Kai Chuck, who was sent it to the current role last October. One of the ones they talked about the rumor for a while is a dedicated YouTube landing page for podcasts, similar to the ones that already exist for fashion and gaming. They could fill that page through direct payments to podcasters, as Bloomberg reported last month, as well as RSS integration. And one of the other shared slides mentions RSS feed pilots that will make it easier to port entire audio libraries over to YouTube. Wow. Yes. Other perks mentioned in the slides include partners sold audio ads, which fit well with music tracks and podcast episodes, search and discovery improvements, like the ability to follow individual shows directly, and new metrics that could connect YouTube to industry standard podcast measurement platforms. If they do that, game changer. Game changer. Now, the other thing I got to make mention of is that we know there's a bunch of hosting platforms that will publish direct to YouTube. And that's pretty good. I use it myself. All my shows are on Spreaker for the most part, and I put them up, except for the uh, when I'm not podcasting. I have to put that up separate, but I record those on Zoom, and I just put them up direct. But well, they're also an audio form. I just put them to an RSS feed, but I don't publish them that way. But I'll tell you what. It's quite interesting. It's a uh, man. If YouTube decides to come in on this, Facebook's tried. Hasn't made a dent. Amazon's done it. Come in. It's there but it's going to take time for them to really pick up and do something with. But if YouTube really comes in with what they're able to do, I mean, I like Google Podcasts as the app. I think they do a really good job with that. I think they do a really good job of making podcasts searchable, in my opinion. YouTube rivals will not sit idly as the video platform edges its way into the podcasting conversation. Now, Spotify recently bought Chartable, and YouTube is going to have to deal with Spotify's heavy spending if it wants to match the audio platform's prowess in the podcasting world. Spotify just has better, more sound acquisitions. They've bought some pretty good platforms. They've done a really good job with their own platform, and you know they've been making some good deals with the right people. So at the moment... It would be at youtube.com slash podcast, but that's not an actual link yet. But maybe in a year's time, you might actually get to it. That's what they're talking about. And by the way, that's not the only thing they talked about. Because YouTube has also talked to podcasters. Give us videos. We'll give you up to $300,000. YouTube is offering to pay individual podcasters and podcasting networks if they upload video versions of their shows. The grants could range from $50,000 for independent creators to $300,000 for large networks. Well, YouTube, I've already been putting my stuff up since 2018. What's up? Where's my grant? I'll take it. <laughs> Come on now. I'm still not eligible to be a... Uh, I, I'm not even eligible to be a creator to monetize with yet. By the way, that, that, that would be something I'd like to really work on best. So if, if you don't mind, huh? Uh, YouTube.com. And look for King of Podcasts or YouTube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O 951. All my YouTube content's there. So all the episodes of Wrestling is Real, Broadcasters Podcast, my previous show, Creative Not Corporate, and when I'm on podcasting, every episode I've done, it's all up there. A thousand different videos up there for you to check out yourselves. YouTube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O 951 or just go to broadcasterspodcast.com. It's there too. You can look for the YouTube link there on the top of the menu. So, so yeah, it's pretty good what they're looking to do and they want to give that kind of money. So we're getting more information about podcasting. It continues to keep coming through. Let's see what they're going to do for what it's worth. Good stuff. Now, I want to take a story real quick from Substack and Patreon reporting about podcasting. Bloomberg talked about now that Substack is poaching Patreon stars for their expanded push into podcasting. So they're recruiting four shows from Patreon. 
Now, Substack already has dozens of podcasts featuring, featuring talent from Lured from other outlets. Their CEO is Hamish McKenzie, offering creators ownership of their subscriber lists. And they're providing grants to podcasters who make the switch. Though McKenzie declined how much the company's paying. The money is worth it because the shows can be extended to other kinds of media, including print and video. And McKenzie brings it up like this, quote, if you just think about it as a podcast, then that's only realizing a fraction of the percentage of the total potential around that community, around that relationship. But if you start thinking of it as a substack, which is this new media type, this new way to build an audience to connect with people, then new things become possible. So they want to get programs primarily interested in a subscription business rather than advertising. These four hours making the switch include the foreign policy program, American Prestige, already has 2,000 paying sub Patreon subscribers, the fifth column, which has 4,000 subscribers, the fifth column, uh, they've been asked to make the switch and they felt comfortable enough to make the move. And this push comes at a time when more companies see potential subscription-based revenue rather than advertising. Apple Podcasts launched their own proprietary subscription feature we talked about on the show. And Spotify also had their own subscription feature as well as partnerships with other platforms as such as supporting cast and Patreon's memberful to bring their content onto the platform. Substack doesn't currently support this technology. So there's that to go with. Like Again, we're seeing in these corporate entities and all these things, okay, do we want to go subscription? Do we want to go advertising? Ad supported or premium? And that's also a question that's been going on for a while. Where I work at, we tried doing that in 2009. And I remember having to put up all that content behind paywalls. Having to make it so that the content was available commercial free, transcribed, and I forget what else we add. We would add some extra things into the content if you paid $30 a month. We tried that. And we got subscribers. I don't know if we broke even. But we eventually had to break that down. And by the way, the technology wasn't there yet. The, the API had to be built from scratch. So if you know your coding technology, let's say it's Cold Fusion and Blue Dragon. For those of you webmasters out there, that's what we were using to get that done. Hey, it more or less worked, but man, it was that was a cluster to make sure that worked and to make sure that the it would be set up that you would have the programming ad ad supported for the first two weeks that the show was published. Then after that, it went premium. But you had to go and buy the premium service, twenty nine ninety nine a month. Very ambitious gesture, and they tried it. It did not work. But hey, we did it first. One of the first to do it. And now these companies, ten years later, they're trying to find a same way to get that that mousetrap. They're trying to build a better mousetrap, see if they can make it work. And I'll give them credit for trying. They are trying. I'll give them that. A story from Entrepreneur Magazine also caught my attention. Podcasting is a new college. They say creating value for listeners also offers a number of unique benefits for listeners. Unlike other forms of content marketing, podcasting opposes a number of unique benefits to businesses leveraging. Topics like education or news are second and third most popular genre of podcasts. 75% of consumers are more likely to purchase from the brands they follow on social media platforms tells us that creating informative content and managing it through a podcast is crucial to your business. It's business ongoing success, which is what we've been talking about with the content I work on. So through e equating a marketing medium like podcasting to the potential value obtained from a college level education makes part criticism for starters. Higher education has become increasingly unaffordable over the past decade accessing podcasts for the remaining educated and informed on news current events and other mainstream topics like business and technology remains completely free addition we have to consider the exponential growth the podcasting industry has experienced over the same approximate period of time part of this growth is directly tied to the factors that make podcasts such an attractive medium to consumers consumers won't need to wait for your next social media post or newsletter they are able to access your entire library of podcast episodes as soon as they search for it your business's podcast content should be engaging and add value to your target consumer market. Leveraging that content can serve as a proverbial library of information about your business, brand, or industry for consumers. Exactly. They're just getting this now? Really? 
There's a lot more to be said about it. Podcasts is the future of brand advertisement. Gone are the days when consumers relied on bombardments of advertisers from television to radio to influence their buying behavior and decision making. It now fills the gap podcasting does with roughly 60% of podcast listeners claiming to have purchased a product or service from a sponsored advertisement and a podcast. And over 70% of listeners who have tuned into a specific podcast for four years or longer made a purchase following a sponsored ad. I did. Dollar Shave Club. If I hear that on, I forget which show I was listening to. Was it Jim Ross or was it uh, Takas Jericho or was it uh, Stone Cold Podcast? I forget. It's one of those they kept talking about Dollar Shave Club. And you know what? I bought it. I bought in. It worked. And I'm still buying it today. What, four years later? I still buy it. Still wish they were a sponsor, though. But I don't have them. So anyway, there's more to that story, but I'm going to leave it there. That you can actually learn a lot from podcasts. But you can learn a lot from YouTube as well, just to be honest here. Now, what about the advertising side? Well, NASDAQ actually put out a story and talked about how there could be profits coming in for Spotify in the podcast sector because they've been trying to make a uh, they've been trying to make a profit for themselves because they've been not a profit maker so far in the years that Spotify has been in existence. So Spotify subscribers are listening to more and more podcasts as the company invests hundreds of millions of dollars into content and technology. And the content investments have been a drag on Spotify's gross margin. But they haven't been turning a profit on its massive podcast investments. But podcast spending will reach more of a steady state going forward. And it doesn't appear to be slowing down the listenership. So the CFO, Paul Vogel, thinks the inflection point on podcasts isn't too far away. And it will be accredited to Spotify's overall gross margin in the future. So they think the advertiser is going to be coming in. And that's what's coming up soon. The ad-supported gross margin fell from 16% to 12% 2018 and 2019, and then 1% in 2020. And then the COVID-19 pandemic created a lot of uncertainty in the advertising market. But then the podcast business started to swing the other way, up 10% 2020 to 2021. And then it saw an 84 basis point contraction in the metric during the fourth quarter due to supply chain impacts on ad spending. But investors should expect podcasting investments to continue weighing on gross margin in 2022. Vogel talked to a recent investors conference and told analysts he's not optimizing for margin right now, but three to five years from now. And they have long-term goals of reaching 1 billion users. They're at 400 million as we speak. Plus 20% plus growth revenue per year and a total gross margin between 30 and 40%. And he says, while podcasting and its associated investments have been a drag on gross margin for the last few years it's starting to move closer towards the consolidated gross margin of the business it will continue to drag gross margin in 2022 but the inflection point is not too far away so they think they're going to make money that it's almost here well the advertisers you got to ask about where are they well we're learning about that inside radio actually put out a story talking about the majority of advertisers looking to spend more on podcasting and streaming audio. Because where else are they going to put their spend on? When you have streaming platforms that already put out a premium service and where they're left out, they have to put their advertising somewhere. So they're going to put it on podcasting and streaming audio because it's available in those platforms. Advertiser perceptions say 53% of ad buyers are expected to survey, uh, they're, they survey to expect to increase their podcast spending in 2022. 46% hold the line from their current spending levels. The free search firm says, quote, they're doing it to fuel both brand and performance advertising. Advertisers recognize the listening audiences are growing and loyal. They now rank podcasts on par with TV for driving brand favorability. And this firm also said that 71% of ad buyers have already discussed buying podcast ads with their colleagues. 44% said it was pretty likely they will actually buy podcast ads in the next six months. They also tracked how the podcast menu is getting a foothold. 45% of ad buyers said they were already using podcasts, and that's up from 11% last year and up from the 15% in 2015. So they are seeing the big difference, tripling up. The firm also says, quote, that in a relatively short time, podcasts have become a viable medium for brand awareness, storytelling, and performance. Instead of fighting for slivers on a niche budget, Podcast providers now compete for significant pieces of advertisers' digital budgets. And yet, even as there is more focus on digital, 
Advertisers are embracing over-the-air radio, too. One in five st- surveyed said they will increase spending on AM, FM radio in 2022, and a majority said they will hold spending levels steady from last year. So they're going to spend money back on audio again, but podcasting is definitely going to get that. This survey was based on a survey conducted in November among 300 media agencies and marketers. There's that. It's great. There's a lot of promise. And so we're just waiting to find out what happens next with all of this down the line. And one more story I want to take into before we can wrap things up. And that's from the infinite dot. Oh, no, I had a few others. Sorry, I had a few more left. Uh, takeaways from the infinite dial from Nielsen Media or Nielsen Research, excuse me. Uh, Edison Research. I'm sorry, Edison Research. There were some things they learned about this, and they said that weekly and monthly podcasting listening has dipped. Uh, Three quarter are now working mostly outside the home versus 70% last year. That's been an impact on podcast listening habits. They also said that 177 million re- Americans have listened to a podcast. One third have listened to podcasts in the car, and that there is diversity success in podcasting because the efforts have been making to create more diverse creators and launch shows and networks that appeal to a broader spectrum of listeners is paying off. The podcast gender gap still exists. Listening can be social, not solitary, and eight is a podcast number. That's eight is the average number of podcasts the weekly podcast listeners told them they consumed in the past week. So there's that. Now, that's where we got right there. Now, one other thing I got to talk about with podcasting, iHeartMedia. They're talking about now creating NFTs for podcasts. NFT Network. Sarah Fisher, IXS.com reports on this. They're pouring several hundred thousand dollars into purchasing the rights to roughly a dozen NFTs to create an NFT-based podcast network. Why does it matter? Well, it marks one of the first major media franchises to introduce a podcast slate of characters and voices united across prominent NFT collections. So they're going to make 10 to 15 investments in prominent NFT collections over the next few days, including CryptoPunks, Mutant 8 Yacht Club, and World of Women per Khalil Twill, Executive Vice President of Strategy at iHeartMedia. They're also eyeing NFT creators such as Quirkies, Cryptodes, and Loot for Adventures. And the idea is to combine the intellectual property for the various NFTs it acquires into a content collection that we'll call the Non-Fun Squad Universe. They will world build for them, creating narratives around them, and bring those stories to life via podcasts. And this commercial manifestation of that universe will be a podcast network called the Non-Fun Podcast Network, a podcast slate centered around the content, characters, and worlds from the Non-Fun Squad. And they will be hosted by voices that portray the NFT characters, Tawil says the company is not only eyeing NFT rights that will allow to commercialize and bring to life the actual NFTs it will buy in ways that work for podcasts. So they're aggressively building out their podcast business as terrestrial radio listeners are moving to streaming. They're really trying to push the envelope to test the assumptions we have around what is IP, what is a host, and what is talent. They want to create a new layer of content leveraging the intellectual property access or excuse me, across several NFTs under one umbrella. And in addition to giving the NFT characters stories around them, iHeartMedia plans to test five to ten of its existing podcast shows as IP for DAOs, a kind of crypto-driven community. So they're all trying things right here. It's a lot of work. And I don't know how that's going to work out, if it's going to be any good or not. Decentralized Autonomous Organization, DAO, if you didn't know what that was, in crypto. So they're kind of clubs for crypto enthusiasts, only they typically operate under a shared goal, give each member equal say in making decisions, and can potentially have more money than most clubs would ever know what to do with. So are they kind of digging for something? Sure. But these companies, are, are they're able to go and do these kind of things, and they're going to just see if they can find gold in them hills in Decentraland, I guess. That's what they're looking for. That's the show, man. I'm, I got some other stories, but I'm going to hold them over. I'll let you know what those are next week. Uh, how streaming is straining literary to TV. And no, that was the only story I did not bring up. I'll bring that up and pull that into next week's show. But that's it. All podcasting on the program. Thanks for listening in. 
to another broadcaster's podcast. Until next week, remember the content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast. Find all the links to subscribe to the show by going to broadcasterspodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program, the Wrestling Is Real Podcast, exclusively at wrestlingisreal.com. 